All right, so this video, my focus is gonna be on um, basically hip hinging motion. Um, if you haven't watched other videos, I'm dealing with some knee issues. Basically, my knee is not hurting, but I can tell that structurally it's kind of being compromised. When I bend my knees and squat low, I can feel my right knee giving out almost. I can feel as if there's a lack of strength there. And I can feel somewhat of a pull on some of the, I couldn't tell if they're like tendons or ligaments. Um, there's, I can feel it on the back of my knee and sometimes on the top of my knee. Um, and so as I've been working on this for weeks now, I've come to somewhat of a conclusion. It's more of a hypothesis, but basically I think that when I squat, my natural, um, my, my natural mechanics are to shift the weight more to my right side because my right leg is stronger. And um, just due to a lot of inactivity basically over the last couple of years, and maybe just it's like a chronic thing without like because I haven't been training properly, who knows. But um, so my left quads are are not as strong as my right side. And I think my right hamstring needs some strengthening. But basically, um, I my, my idea is that you don't it's not a good idea just to like um, to overcompensate either. So I'm training just my hamstrings in general and training my my lower back because I think just posterior train posterior chain training right now is what's going to save me. Um, I think I'm doing a lot of loading on, on pushing movements, as in squatting and stuff like that. What I need to do is more um, kind of like pulling motions, basically using my backside to lift the weight. So I've heard this exercise called good morning. I've heard it called a lot of things. Um, I just call it hyperextension because if you've been to the gym, you've seen that machine where you kind of like, uh, there's like a, a setup where you can put your feet on, on a kind of like a platform and it's angled. So diagonally, so that you can hang off the edge, and you um you hyperextend your back. Um, I don't have one of those machines. I, and that's not even a machine. It's more like um, it's just like a platform. But anyway, I probably need one of those, but I don't have money or want to buy one right now. So this is what I figure is the most natural way natural way to um compensate for not having that machine. Um, I also have a. I think it's like a 30 pound dumbbell or no, um, what's it called? Kettlebell. And so, um, what I'll do is I will kind of use that as a way to do hyper extensions. And the key is to, because it's not like, um, a fixed range of motion, like on a machine is that you have to be really, um, attentive to how your muscles are feeling and which ones are being used to do the motion because our bodies and our minds are super adept at, um, taking mechanical shortcuts basically like making it more efficient so that the, your body can just lift the weight regardless of which muscles are involved so when you're lifting the weight try and keep your knees like s somewhat bent and straight um but if you lock them out you're basically going to be you're going to be using your hamstrings more than anything so keep them slightly bent and when you bend upwards the flexion should come from only your lower back and so Flex as far as your lower back will allow you, and you'll actually see that the range of motion is only a few inches. If you go higher than that, you've automatically started using your legs or some other muscle group to lift your trunk up. So um, just keep in mind that the range of motion is going to be small. Um, but when I go to the barbell, so that's with the kettlebell. That's basically just to give my lower back a pump and to feel and put it on the map, basically. Feel where it's at um, and activate it. When it comes to the barbell, I do a full range of motion because this is how I feel I can best prepare myself for squatting. Because um, I also do have a problem when I squat that my body um, tends to not want to stay upright and it, my body folds forward. And so um, I'm warming up to do the good morning stuff. And basically, um, I, I, as I as I go through the workout, progressively, I, I need I'm starting to get lower and lower and lower in my range of motion. And it's like, it's a mental correction I have to make because my body does not want to be forced into that uncomfortable position just because my lower back is weak. And so as I bend lower, um, my my body tends to resist that motion. So I just have to push myself to om as, as basically as parallel as possible with the ground. And then I come back up. Also keeping in mind not to compromise form or rigidity. You want to pretend like you have a heavy weight on your back and at like as you're squatting you need to keep your body as as upright as possible so even though this weight is not super heavy um it should be just enough to force you into some discomfort and so i messed with a few different stances and i'm still trying to figure out which one is the best um i figured 
um, that going narrower is 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 got to be better than a wider stance. Just because the wider you go, I think the your out outer hip muscles. I don't know what to call them, but the the hip the hip muscles on the outside of your legs on the outside of your body, they they tend to activate more while you're um, in a wide legged stance. So the, today I noticed that when I kept my feet more narrow, is when I could feel my my back working more. But I also noticed the benefit because my my intention here is to work my lower. Back. Sorry, the recording cut out. Um, basically, I'm trying to put my lower back on the map and also um, stretch and contract my hamstrings. So the issue that I think most people find with um, with discomfort or um, let's say weakness in muscles is that uh, for some reason we have this idea that we need to stretch everything. That when something's tight or when something's weak. We need to just stretch, 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 and that's what's going to help us recover. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think that if a muscle is tight, most likely the muscle is weak, and stretching it is only going to make it weaker. If you think of it like a rubber band, like basically your your body has a system of pulleys and rubber bands that are like strapped around each of your joints and your um, your limbs, and the the contraction or the pulling of the rubber bands and the leverage is what moves your limbs around. And so a weak rubber band is... Or like one that will snap easier is one that can't stretch and that's tighter. And so if you compare that to that analogy to muscles, your muscles that are the weakest are the ones that will refuse to stretch. And your body mechanically has made adjustments to protect those muscles from being um, compromised. So if you feel tightness or discomfort anywhere, um, you should probably address it as a weakness first rather than or like something that needs to be that needs to be addressed and strengthened. It needs to be exercised rather than stretching it. Because the stre- the more you stretch it, the the more you're exposing your muscles to the um, the exact thing it wants to avoid, which is potential ta- with pot- potential tearing and damage. And so, um, for example, I'm doing this today because um, I haven't been doing posterior chain exercises as much as I should have. And you'll I notice that when I when I sit in the car or sit in a chair upright then my lower back starts to hurt. And I felt this feeling before, but it's basically, um, once you start training your lower back and your hips, if that's the weak part of your body, as soon as you start training them, you're gonna feel a ton of discomfort because your body um, has given it, has basically assigned it a certain workload and capacity that's very small, very minimal. And now you're starting to stress it. Basically the muscles start crying and um, it's like like a little baby that needs um, that needs attention. The crying or the discomfort is basically to draw your attention to the fact that your muscles need building and they need repair. And so the only way to do that is by obviously by um, like dieting and nutrition. But what happens is that the blood is what takes the nutrients to the system. So um, if you want to help a, a weak muscle or if you have discomfort anywhere, the last thing you want to do is to avoid training it. Because what will happen is if you train it... Um, with low intensity but high volume is that blood will start to be pumped right to the place where it needs to go and and sooner rather than later the muscle in the system itself is going to become healed and become stronger so keep that in mind as you're dealing with um, discomfort and uh any kind of pain maybe that comes from like you maybe you just started going to the gym and you're starting to notice these growing pains don't be discouraged just know that that's part of it you're just going to have to tough it out but at some point maybe after a week or so, if you continue training that part of your body, um, you'll start to notice the discomfort starts to fade. And that's exactly what what happens, is that your body has a way of sending signals, um, but often we don't know how to interpret these signals. So your body is is amazingly adept at letting us know what's going on, where, um, where attention needs to be focused on. But the signal that comes sometimes is hard to interpret, and it's just due to the fact that these days, People don't have a, such a sound and complete knowledge, I guess, of how to, I guess, train your body. And so a lot of these things I've kind of had to figure out on my own. But I think that if this was more commonly made, uh, like like public knowledge, or I guess um, if it was just common knowledge for people to, um, to recover by training instead of recover by resting, I think we'd see a lot of improvement, I guess, in people's overall health. Um, so this is my last set. I think I put, I was doing 25s and fives, and then I just decided to put the extra five on there. Basically it's 35s on each side. Um, I did five set. Once I warmed up, I did five sets for um, five reps each. So 25 reps total. And basically just, um, 
keeping the blood flowing to my back the whole time. I didn't want to kill myself because even though the um, I want to correct the the issue, overtraining will make it just as bad. So I just want to keep it light. You know, it's funny you can when I bend over, you can see my fat rolls hanging through my shirt. But that's okay because I know some some of us got them. Some of us got those fat rolls, so we just gotta keep working, and eventually they'll be they'll be gone. And so after this, um, I went to some seated squats. I know I said I was working posterior chain, but today, um, like I, it was like I was doing posterior chain, and I felt like I had done enough. And so I wanted to put some a little bit of weight on my knees to see how they were feeling. And so I did this like this seated squat. This is basically a way for I think um, is more commonly used for athletes to improve explosivity and to improve um, reaction time. Um, the idea that you sit down and as soon as your butt touches the chair, you stand back up. And so the first rep, it's like, I've been training full range of motion squats and my, I think my body has been, been accustomed to moving slower to, to be, I guess, more careful with the weight. And so as soon as I touched the bench, it was like a, a jolt or like a shock went through my body. It's like, oh wait, I have to stand back up. And then like, it improves, um, how fast you can stand up out of the squat. But basically with that shortened range of mo shortened range of motion, what I felt is that, um, the the lower my lower quads which are connected to my knee basically my lower quads are the ones that were doing more of the work and i could feel like the blood rushing to those those parts of my body and so right now all i want to do is um tighten up my my posterior chain by tr um like train it a little bit more often more frequently until it gets stronger and at the same time just any way i can keep my knees moving and flexing going through the range of motion and getting blood to the to the system so that's my focus right now. I also did five sets of five on this squat. Um, and then I think that was it for my workout. And so for anyone who hasn't been watching lately, my issue right now is that um, I haven't been eating as much as I need to eat. And that's due to the fact that like I just moved here and I, ha I haven't been able to find a job. But literally um, yesterday, I think I, I finally got something to fall through or no, not fall through. Fall through is when it it's bad. Basically, I got a job, and so I'm starting tomorrow. Within two weeks, I'll get my first paycheck, and I'll be able to start eating. And so if anyone's exercising, anyone's getting into it um, and considering taking it seriously, one thing I would advise is to make sure that whatever amount of working out you do is directly proportional to how much you're eating. Make sure that your foods that you're eating are um, at least 50% whole foods. So like that means that once a day at least, you're eating a, a nice big meal that you cooked yourself with um, with meat and vegetables like chicken is my favorite. Um, but like, I, I don't think it's super important to eat 100% clean. And I don't think there's even a, a reason to assume that that's going to make your gains come faster. What I've seen is that as long as I'm eating my calories and making sure that I have a decent amount, like one big meal a day, like I said, that I cook myself and then whatever else I eat, um, as long as it's not super sugary, I've been able to see progress. And so... Um, I would even recommend eating Panda Express at least once a week because a lot of times um, I've, I've been deficient on calories and the only thing that I was able to help me keep the maintain my calorie um, maintenance was to eat Panda Express. And so that's that's my theory at this point is that vegan, not vegan stuff, oh, what's it called? Organic stuff is kind of a little bit oversold. Basically, someone's trying to make a profit off of that um, that that avenue, I guess, of like, of healthy eating. But if you think about it, all foods should have nutrients in it. Obviously, some foods have more. But as long as you're eating one good meal a day, I think you should have enough nutrients to, to get through. And so that way, it's easier psychologically, when you're able to eat one, like you, you force yourself to eat one good meal a day. And after a while, you get you'll get used to eating that the healthier food, and especially since it has to be in a large quantity, because the healthier food tends to have um, less calories for more nutrients and so you have to eat a lot of it to get the right amount of calories and then if you allow yourself to eat like normal food like I guess pizza Panda Express um, those are like, basically my go-to's anywhere I can get a burger anywhere I can get um, Chinese food or pizza all that stuff is is great for maintaining calories and also maintaining your spirits because you don't want to get super um, depressed and down on yourself for not being able to eat so much healthy food but anyway, that's it for today. See you guys later.